The next uh, portion again is we're going to go through the meaning of life. The way I kind of have this laid out is for us to kind of kind of break down what the meaning of life is not. And I think by breaking that down, we're only going to have one option left. And I pray that when you see this option, the meaning of life, that you are blessed by it and that you pursue a closer relationship with Christ. All right. So basically in this section, we're going to learn the answer to the age old question. What is the meaning of life? Now, the reason this type of question is so significant isn't because of the intellect of the person asking it. Rather, it is because the answer will determine how a person will ultimately live. The way in which people tend to live their lives says much of what they consider to be important and meaningful. For example, when a person who says, well, the purpose of my life is to have fun and party, will tend to live life recklessly, selfishly, and looking for nothing else than to stimulate their nerve endings. Similarly, the person who chooses to live their lives in pursuit of power and recognition will ultimately become a slave to their accomplishments. So basically what that portion is focusing on is the fact that if you look at a person's lifestyle, you'll be able to tell in a, in, in a rough estimation what the meaning of their life is. If a person is getting drunk and partying and being lascivious, you can tell that the meaning of life is to satisfy themselves. In the same way, when you see a person who is prideful, who will step on anybody in order to achieve their goals, you can see that their meaning of life is themselves. It's selfishness. So a pressing question for the whole audience. When people look at you, what do they see the meaning of life? And you, what, what, what is it that they see or they believe that the meaning of life is to you? Okay. Now, uh, one quote that I want to share with you guys is, is a popular athlete. I don't remember the guy, uh, but I remember the quote. An athlete was once asked, he wished. So basically an athlete was once asked what he wished someone would have told him when he first started playing his sport. He replied, I wish that someone would have told me that when you reach the top, there's nothing there. You see, many of our goals reveal their emptiness only after years of having pursuing them and learning that there was a wasted amount of time, which makes it extremely important for us as followers of Jesus Christ to not only clearly identify the meaning of life, but to be able to give it and uh, verbalize it to individuals so that we do not aimlessly waste our own lives pursuing something that isn't true. Again, the focus of this lesson is to teach us what the meaning of life is not, and then to reveal what the meaning of life is. So let's start with the first one. Can the meaning of life be found within ourselves? Am I the meaning of my own life, basically? Let's see. Now, I wholeheartedly believe that our view of God determines our perspective of life. So how we look at God, basically, is what I'm saying, is how we look at God is going to determine our perspective of the rest of our lives. Thereby, it influences what we believe the meaning of life to be and where we find our refuge in times of trouble. Uh, let's read a scripture. In Jeremiah, everybody turn to your Bibles if you have it with you. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 and 24. It states, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me. You see, basically in this scripture, we are given man's view in contrast with God's view. You see, when you look at Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 and 24, it says, don't trust in your wisdom, don't trust in your might, and don't trust in your riches. But if you're going to trust and you're going to proclaim anything, it needs to be that you know and understand God. So to those individuals who say, well, we can't know and understand God, the Lord says that you should be able to boast in that. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to be able to perfectly understand or conceive the way God conceives and, and thinks. But we can understand the scriptures that have been given to us because it was by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, by the blood of the saints and people who have died to so that we can have this word. So this word has been given to us. That means this word is for us to understand. So we can understand the word of God. Um, 
So I want to also read, uh, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8 through 10. Again, that scripture is 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 through 10. It states, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. Any individual who tells me that they believe in themselves, I don't like that saying, by the way. I understand the sentiment behind it. I get it when somebody says, well, just believe in yourself. They're just trying to say, be encouraged. But I don't even like using those words because it denotes something. It denotes that you're reliable. And so immediately what I think about is 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8 through 10. Notice, Peter, is, is Peter speaking here, by the way? He says, for we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. So basically, he doesn't want you to be unaware that they go through difficult situations. And then he says, for we were so utterly burdened, what does it say? Beyond our strength, that we despaired of life itself. Now, I believe wholeheartedly that followers of Christ are sometimes burdened beyond their strength. Even the apostles were burdened beyond their strength. But why did the Lord allow that to happen? The scripture says, but that was to make us not, make us rely not on ourselves, but on God. Sometimes the difficult moments that we go through in life is not about you, but it's about God. And whether he allows you to understand the difficult situations is up to him. But to be completely honest, and according to this scripture, difficult situations are sometimes allowed to happen in your life so that you can learn not to rely on yourself. That's the point. And then he uses something that I love is uh, past, present, and future tenses in order to explain a very, very uh, poignant uh, subject. He says, to make us not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So that's Christ and God, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then it says, he delivered us. He will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. Notice he said he delivered us. That means Peter is able to recognize that the Lord has delivered him in the past from difficult situations. That gives him the faith to believe that he will deliver him in a present situation. And because the Lord delivered him in a past and a present situation, it also means that he has now faith to believe that when difficult circumstances come in the future, that he will deliver them from that, deliver them from that as well. We cannot rely on ourselves as followers of Christ. I don't care how much somebody tells you to believe in yourself. You are fallible. You will make mistakes. You will mess up. Your own mind deceives you. This is why we need to rely on Christ and on him alone. Now, yet in this day and age, we have become so inundated by motivational speakers, self-help books, and positive mantras that the line easily becomes blurred as to where our source of strength comes from. Now, I'm not saying that every motivational speech is bad. Some of them can actually you know, help to encourage and to help individuals overcome difficult situations. My problem with motivational speakers is that they have a common thread. The common thread is constantly that you are the source of your own strength. And I don't like that. And neither, according to the scriptures, does God like that. Now, one look out into the world is all a person needs in order to realize that we live in a society that glorifies people over God. Let us go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. I mean, chapter 2, I'm sorry. So 2 Timothy, so turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 1 through 5. It states, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, 
treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. This is a harsh scripture, but it is a very sobering one. Here's what's sobering about it. Not only does he show you what the last days will be like, but notice the fact that he no he named all these wicked acts and then said having a form of godliness. That means an individual could be that perverted and still appear to you as godly or have a form of righteousness in their own eyes or even in your eyes. You can be deceived. How many pastors and preachers does it take for us to realize as followers of Christ that we can't put our trust in men when we see these men fall? When we see pastors who say one thing and then do another or behind closed doors, they're committing adultery on their wife. How many pastors and how many leaders does it take for us to see that, wait a minute, we shouldn't rely on ourselves and we shouldn't rely on other men? Then the scripture says, have nothing to do with such people. That means to separate yourselves from individuals like that. And though that is hard at times, we have to do it even for our own safety. Because what happened with Solomon? He surrounded himself with beautiful women and he got what? Led away and led astray into sin. We can't think that we are so high minded and so and so uh, filled with the Holy Spirit that we cannot fall to temptation. We have to make sure that we separate or get people out of our lives that are like that. This doesn't mean we don't interact. We don't shun them. But we do separate ourselves to make it clear. We cannot uh, can't call a person our friend. If they're doing all these wicked acts. We cannot be friendly and say, oh, well, that's my brother in the Lord. No, that's the scripture says to separate, have nothing to do with them. OK, so after that, I want to I want actually want to actually um, demonstrate to you some of the quotes that I've actually taken from the Internet. And I want to show you that these are the types of quotes that are in self-help books and motivational speakers actually say. Now, I'm not going to tell you where I got the quotes from or who said it. The reason being is because I don't want to give them any attention or any advertisement. But I challenge you to just Google quotes for motivational speakers, and you're going to quickly realize that there's another spirit behind it. Okay, so I have four quotes I want to share with you guys. Here's one, the first one. And this is a motivational speaker speaking. You are one thing only. You are a divine being, an all-powerful creator. You are a deity in jeans and a t-shirt. And within you dwells the infinite wisdom of the ages and the sacred creative force of all that is, will be, and ever was. That is a quote from a self-help book to encourage individuals. And it is a doctrine of demons. Listen to some of the things it says. It says, number one, you are a divine being. The scriptures say that we were created by God. It says that their quote says that you are an all powerful creator. The word of God says that there is only one creator in God. It says you are a deity in jeans and a T-shirt. They're calling you God. Then it says, and within you dwells the infinite wisdom of the ages and the sacred creative force of all that is. It is making man God. Here's the next quote. You are your master. Only you have the master keys to open the inner locks. As a follower of Christ, we have one master, and that is God. But again, with these self-help gurus and motivational speakers, they want you to be all about you. So they make you a God. The third one. Prayer is the sign of your weakness. Rely on your inner strength. You will be the winner. It says prayer is a sign of weakness, but the Lord Jesus Christ said to pray. And then he says, rely on your inner strength. As we read in uh, Corinthians, we're not supposed to rely on ourselves. And here's the last quote. Faith in God is optional, but faith in the self and the spirit within 
is imperative. Have faith in yourself. Have faith in the human first, then God if you want. This comes from a self-help book. It is totally contrary to scripture. But individuals who read this are thinking that they're going in the right direction. And we think that Satan has nothing to do with motivational speakers or, or, or the communication that we hear. Satan's all over this thing. There are many doctrines of demons out there. I don't care how they dress it up. And again, I'm not saying that every motivational speaker says this. But what I am saying is that most are proponents of believing in yourself and trusting in yourself. But this is the kind of spirit that's operating behind them. So after a careful examination of these quotes, what seems to be eerily familiar? I want you guys to think about it. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 5, Satan makes the statement, For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Using one Bible verse and a couple of foolish quotes made by men, we are easily able to discern that the spirit behind those individuals is Satan. Because all of those quotes pointed to you becoming like God. So to put it simply, if a person strives to find the meaning of life within themselves, they are in fact raising themselves up to the level of God and reducing God to the level of man. Youngster fam actually shared a pretty good scripture I want to share with everybody. It's uh, Psalm chapter 100 and verse 3. It says, Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Um, I, I, From what I'm reading, he would say, yeah, he said, yeah, the New Age movement also say they, they are God and they created themselves. And that's why he brought up that scripture. And that's a, a great scripture. And I thank you very much, uh, Youngster Fan, for sharing that. Because... It is, we have to understand our, the proper perspective and our proper order. We are under God. We are not God. We don't create things with what we say. We don't speak things into existence. Because that scripture is actually talking about God and not men. But men take that scripture and say, oh yeah, we could do that. That's what happens when we listen to preachers and pastors, but we actually don't read the text. We can easily, the scriptures can actually be made twisted in a way where it makes us and puts us on the same level as God. And we have to be very careful. Okay. So I want to move forward uh, because we, we finished my, the, the portion of can the life of meaning of life be found within ourselves? I think uh, biblically and demonstrably, we destroy that argument. So the meaning of life cannot be found in ourselves. Look at another meaning of life for some people. And it can, and basically the question is going to be posed is can the meaning of life be found in the things we possess? And of course, to me, that's a resounding no, but I want to just flesh that out a little more. Uh, now, I know many people find their purpose in life through accumulation of possessions. Like, for example, um, the overconsumption of technology is an unrelenting uphill battle to stay relevant. Basically, people stand in ridiculously long lines for the so-called privilege of being amongst those having the latest gadget, only to find that the item they worked so hard for is now obsolete, which begs the question, don't they realize that accumulating more things is becoming an unending cycle of slavery? Individuals buy bigger homes, bigger vehicles, and more stuff. Thereby, thereby uh, becoming slaves to the very things they believe they own, when in reality, their possessions have become their masters. Now, I want you guys to think about this. To what extreme do you think people are willing to sacrifice for their possessions? Think about that question. What are people willing to sacrifice for things? So I, I grabbed this article. Um, it's very, very insightful. 
Um, let me read it to you guys. Back in June 2011, there was a report of a 17-year-old teenage male named Wang that had reportedly sold his kidney for $3,350 to purchase an Apple iPad 2 and a laptop. The young boy is alive but is suffering with renal failure thanks to the illegal kidney transplant. Renal failure basically is described as like the rapid loss of kidney, uh, the kidney's ability to remove waste from the body and kind of help balance the, uh, the fluids and electrolytes in the patient's body. In Wang's case, one kidney just wasn't enough to do the job. Typical treatments include a strict diet, possible antibiotics, an IV-based medicine, and even dialysis. This is, and then uh, another reporter quotes, this is a failure of education. The first, the, the first purpose of which is to propagate morality, said one comment on Hong Kong's Phoenix TV website. The teenager's foolish behavior is a manifestation of his radically materialistic values. To sell a kidney in order to buy consumer goods? What vanity. So we have this young boy who sells an organ of his body in order to purchase an Apple iPad 2, which is obsolete right now, and a laptop. And she said that it was a failure of education. I partly believe that. Failure of education and the word of God. That's what I believe it is. But also, it also demonstrates the mindset of many people. Now, everybody listening to this might be like, that guy is crazy. There's no way that I would do that. But don't jump too hard on the kid. I want you to also take a look at this. Now, I admit that it is a rare and extreme case, but how many people do you know or have seen that have given up precious time with their families during the holidays simply to participate in a Black Friday sale? All you have to do is a quick YouTube search to find videos of people being stampeded, killed, and injured for the sake of a discount on material possessions. So most individuals will look at this young um, Asian boy and say, well, he's absolutely mad. But then in the next day, they'll like forsake time with their families and say, well, I got to hit that sale. It's the same thing, just done on a lower scale. We have to be righteous in our act and how we behave. I don't believe in my personal opinion that as Christians, we should be seen doing those things. I personally, my my personal view is I'm not going to take I'm not going to take time with my family and sacrifice it on the altar of greed. As followers of Christ, we should never be seen doing those things. But yet, individuals who call themselves Christians are also sometimes lovers of themselves and their possessions. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. Now, um, to be honest, many people have sold their souls for the sake of accumulating wealth. I mean, all you got to do is a quick YouTube search on musicians and you'll see that a lot of them, a lot of their songs, a lot of the uh, things that they say is, you know, they sold their soul to the devil or they sold themselves or they sold out. You know, we hear these things, but sometimes they just pass over our, our heads and don't really stick. When you hear an individual say, I sold my soul to the devil in order to become wealthy, that is not a light statement. People are actually selling their souls for possessions. I want to read a scripture. Um, it's pretty long, so I'm, I'm going to read it completely, and, and then we'll expound on it a little more. It's in Luke chapter 12, verse 13 through 21. And this is what Jesus Christ has to say about individuals who would accumulate wealth. Again, real quick, mm -hmm. real quick, brother Jordan, you need to stop doing that. This is a second scripture I was thinking about bringing out. You brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say I'm, I'm serious. Oh, my God. Thank you, Lord God Almighty. Go ahead. <laughs> no problem, brothers. Hey, that's the Holy Spirit, not us. That's why it's good. All right. So in Luke chapter 12, verse 13 through 21, it's talking about the rich fool. It, and it states. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. 
But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. This is an amazing, amazing parable the Lord used. And I want you to contrast, not contrast, I want you to compare that with what you see, the, the mindset of the world we are in now. Everybody is trying to accumulate wealth. In another sense, I would say, uh, tr trying to bring it down a level, individuals put so much stock in retirement. Oh, I'm going to save all this money so when I retire, I can live a great life. I'm going to pour all my soul, my mind, and my strength into working hard day in and day out, sacrificing my time with God, my time with family, and all these things so that I can finally have enough to retire and then live like you're on vacation for the rest of your life. That is not the will of God. God said, he is your riches. He is the one you should pursue. And he uses a wonderful example because this man had two options. He could have, he had, I'm sorry, he had, yeah, he had two options. The option he took was, I'm going to build bigger things so I can have more. The second option he had was, I have, why didn't he think I had so much? Maybe I could go help others and feed them and take care of them. It's not about accumulating wealth in this world. And he even focuses in toward the end by calling him a fool because now he's going to die. And then all that work you did, where did it go? When an individual takes the opportunity to just accumulate wealth for themselves, that's a sign of pride because you think you're going to live tomorrow. You have the unmitigated gall to say, I am definitely going to live tomorrow. So this is why I'm doing that. This is why the scriptures say the Lord will pray that it be the Lord's will that we will do this or do that. This is why it's, it's, it's extremely important. And uh, according to the end of that verse says, uh, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Our focus is not living our best life now. Because if we do that and we try to do everything we can and live our best life now, then we are decreasing the value of Christ. Because if our best life is now, what is the life to come? Is that less? Is that not the best? I'd rather suffer in this life and be with the Lord forever after this life. I'm going to have my best life later, not because of anything I did, but because of his grace and his mercy. Now, just in case we believe that it is only useless items that can be coveted after. Now, we're looking, you know, we say all oh, these riches and these things. Oh, of course, that's not. That's crazy. But Jesus Christ makes this statement in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 34. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? 
they do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Notice that the items that people that the pagans covet after are not evil items, food, clothing, shelter, but yet we can make an idol of these very things. Think about it. We go to work um, and we, we work to the bone trying to figure out how to provide for ourselves, not knowing that it is the Lord who provides for us. And the reason we have a job is to glorify his name to the people we're working with. If you look at your job like that, it won't be as terrible. I know sometimes we have jobs and, and they're difficult and they're stressful. But in all actuality, we work those jobs to be a glory, uh, to be the glory of God to the people that we work with. It is the Lord who provides, not our own hands. This is why we're supposed to ask the Lord to bless the work of our hands, not to bless us with the ability to provide for ourselves, but for him to provide for us. Also, notice he says, you know, not to worry about these things because today has enough trouble. It's very important for us as believers in Christ not to fret over things that may or may not happen. A lot of us become worried and anxious. The scriptures say that the Lord is not does not give us the spirit of fear, but instead he gives us the power of a sound mind. You see, so we're not supposed to be afraid. When we're afraid, that denotes anxiety. Now, I know some individuals will say, just don't be anxious. Well, you can't do that. You can't just, you don't get to a situation and say, you know what? I'm going to be anxious. No, I'm not going to be anxious. No, it naturally flows from you, which also demonstrates whether you are spending time with the Lord or not. When you're spending close time with God, your natural reaction will be that of not being anxious. And that is extremely important. It's not about saying, okay, when I get to this situation, I'm not going to be anxious. That's not what it's talking about. The Lord said, don't be anxious. You think we can just choose that? We just naturally are or aren't. But the thing is, the more time you spend with the Lord, the more time you spend in prayer, the more time you spend with him your natural reaction or inclination is going to be, I don't have to worry about that because I've been reading my word and the Lord says that he's going to take care of me. Do you see the value of spending time with God and his word? And also showing you that possessions are not the meaning of life. Um, one more example I want to share before we finish this section about the meaning of life cannot be found in possessions. Um, Abraham and Sarah, I believe, is a good example to show us a little bit about our patience or impatience in that sense, or being faith, faithful. Um, in other words, sometimes we can work so hard that we can actually try to help God along in the process, thinking that, well, Lord, I know you're going to provide for me, but I have to fill in the blank. I have to do my own fill in the blank. Notice that when he said that the, that the birds neither sow nor reap, which means they don't work. I'm not saying don't work. What I'm saying is that they are not their own providers. God is your provider. So Abraham and Sarah were given a promise that they would have a child. But because of their impatience and faithlessness in God's promise, Sarah asked Abraham to sleep with her maidservant. Now, what was the result of her decision, of their decision, I should say? Their son that they worked so hard for 
to the point of sacrificing Sarah's peace of mind, was not given the promise. Their work, in a sense, was null and void, and God fulfilled his promise just as he said he would. It is the same with us. Notice, Abraham and Sarah did everything they could to help God along in the process of having this child, and it still didn't work out. Now, I want you to ask yourself the question, how many things have you tried to help the Lord along with, and it still didn't go your way? Just think about that. So God is going to provide for you in the way he wants to provide for you, not in the way you want and not in the, um, not in the fashion that you want as well. In James chapter four, turn to your Bibles, James chapter four, verse one through three, it states, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Isn't this reflective of the world we see today? You see, our desires for material possessions cloud our God-given conscience and causes us to resort to all kinds of evil to attain it. It is by this that we can know for, for certain that the meaning of life cannot be found in the things we possess. What is your motive for accumulating wealth? What is the reason? Your motive is most likely the thing that you hold close. If your motive is to accumulate wealth, to feed the hungry, then praise the Lord. But if it's for you to build some kind of fancy life on this earth, then I think you need to recheck what's really important in your life. All right. So the next portion is, let me get myself together. Okay. So we went through, can the meaning of life be found in ourselves? We knocked that one out the park. No, it cannot be found in ourselves. Can the meaning of life be found in possessions? Absolutely not. We debunked that one. Now, this next one, can the meaning of life be found in people? Now, as strange as it may seem to us, there have been people who have found the meaning of their lives in other people. Now, most of us are usually familiar with the likes of like the false messiahs and cult leaders like David Koresh, Charles Manson, and Jim Jones. Now, these were individuals who used their subtle power of influence to deceive the masses into believing that they were something special and worthy of worship. Now, Unfortunately, the, um, the people who put their trust in them ended up dead, in prison, or emotionally scarred for life. As a person might rightly ask, what would possess a person to worship someone who is just like them? Now, the problem isn't an intellectual one. It's a spiritual one. I want to read um, Psalm chapter 146 and verse 3, and then I'm, right after that, I'm going to read Psalm 118 and verse 8. So again, I'm going to read Psalm 146 and verse 3 first. It says, do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. And in Psalm chapter 118 and verse 8, it states, it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. Now, there are two points with these scriptures, um, excuse me, that these scriptures make about man. Number one, a man cannot save you or protect you. You may be thinking, save and protect me from what? Now, in John chapter 3, and verse 36, it reads, Whosoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. So without Jesus Christ, the wrath of God abides on every living person, like we spoke about earlier when I was talking about Job. And no king, prince, president, dictator, or leader of any kind can rescue us from that. So our salvation and refuge are only found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's the crazy thing. The subtleties of this uh, form of idolatry is very dangerous because it's very subtle. It's not something that's out in the open. Like most people, when asked about it, would immediately deny their guilt of such a blasphemous sin. Yet, when we consider the state of our society, we can clearly see evidence that people are, in fact, being idolized. Now, let me give you an example. Uh, Michael Jackson, perhaps one of the most popular entertainers worldwide. His pictures and his merchandise littered the walls and bedrooms of teenagers and adults everywhere during the height of his popularity. 
People would faint, scream, and cry any time he would perform or make an appearance. The same goes on today with many entertainers and actors. So what do you think this type of enamoring or adoration of an individual develops in the heart of their followers? To be completely honest with you, it develops idolatry. And this same thing happens when we sacrifice time with family, our spouse, and even time with God for the sake of pleasing our bosses at work. Now, what I want you to know is that Satan is subtle. Satan is not going to just throw something in your face and say, hey, commit idolatry. That's obvious. But what he's going to do is bring you to the point or tempt you to the point of you actually making an idol of people and things. So since we're dealing with people here, um, now most of us are probably guilty of putting posters or whatever it is of these entertainers in our rooms. Some of us haven't, and that's fine. But the majority of individuals in this world idolize individuals who are superstars. For example, you see a superstar walking in the street, You'll have somebody scream and run to them and say, oh, yeah, that's the person I want to meet. You get their order. You treat them like a god. And that's dangerous. I mean, when you, saw, when you see people like in concerts, when they faint. Imagine they're looking at an idol or a false god. Think of the book of Daniel when they all bowed down. Not Daniel and, 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 his, and uh, the three men didn't bow down, but I'm talking about all the other individuals bowed down to the idol that King Nebuchadnezzar sent. They, now, I could say with 100% certainty that a lot of those people did not believe that that was an actual God. But because of fear of the majority, they bowed down. And because of fear of the majority of individuals now calling somebody crazy because they believe that entertainment is a form of idolatry, we're going to be spoken about as Christians if we're walking the Christian life. So, again, the subtleties of idolatry are extremely, extremely dangerous, and it can be done with men. Now, can the church fall victim to this form of idolatry? That's the question for you guys. So, as Christians, our identity we know is found in Jesus Christ. For example, I'm going to read um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1-7. through 7. It states, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe. As the Lord has assigned to each his task, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. So that form of idolatry was even existing in the Old Testament times because they were lifting up men. They were saying, well, I, oh, I'm more righteous because I was blessed by Paul himself or Apollos. They were lifting up individuals. And that happens in the church today. We, we have, like, for example, I want you guys to think about when an individual comes to you with a problem and, and just say like a difficult situation in their life. What's the first thing you tell them? Do you tell them to go to the word of God or do you recommend a book that was written by a Christian? Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to recommend a book, but what I am saying is that our immediate response should be prayer, listen, and then give the word of God for encouragement. Not, hey, I think you should read this author. He, he's so insightful. The Lord is the one who is super insightful, not men. And, and so when we look at these circumstances in Corinthians, we see that people were doing that. They were uplifting teachers the same way people do it today. Um. And it's been permeating throughout the entire church, unfortunately, where we want to sell books versus tell people to read the scriptures. Um, and many false preachers are successful because of the lack of biblical literacy and lack of reliance on God amongst churchgoers. You see, church members around the world are holding up the teachings of their pastors instead of the teachings of Jesus Christ. Now, if the teachings of your pastor are in line with Jesus Christ, it's still not the teaching of the pastor. 
It's the teaching of Jesus Christ. And we shouldn't uphold and say, well, this man has so much wisdom. Now, a man can have wisdom. But what I'm saying is if you uplift him as he is the source of your interpretation of scripture, that's when it becomes dangerous. Um, and one more thing. So our purpose demonstrably cannot be found in people. So we've debunked that people is the meaning of life. We've debunked that um, possessions are the meaning of life. And we've absolutely debunked the fact that you are the meaning of life. So what's left? <laughs> I pretty much took everything away from an individual, basically, on the meaning of life. So I'm going to move right into this. Uh, I'm going to give you uh, just a brief overview of what the meaning of life is. I know it's late and I know you guys are tired. I don't want to keep you guys from your families or from work tomorrow. But um, here's what we're going to do. Now that we've established those things that are not the purpose of life, so what is our purpose? And what is the meaning of our lives? How does all that information we learned about apologetics and, and owning your faith and the meaning of life, how does that all tie in? Um, now, this is one of the most common philosophical questions because asked by people throughout the centuries. But here is the meaning of life. Our life is to glorify God. In its simplest form, that's what it is. Our lives are meant to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ says in John chapter 13, verse 34 through 35, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20, it states, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I'm going to give you five, five purposes or, or five reasons in a sense Number one, the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart. Number two, love your neighbor as yourself. And the Great Commission, go and make disciples. And fellowship with God's family by baptizing them and then helping them and discipling them. Teach them to do all things. To grow in maturity and to be like Christ. Here's a couple of encouraging scriptures for you guys. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance as our way of life. Again, as our way of life. Jesus Christ has prepared us to do good works for him, to glorify his name. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people put a light neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Again, and glorify your Father in heaven. The ultimate result in this world that we can achieve is to bring glory to God through our way of life. As we fulfill God's purpose for our lives, we point to God through our acts of worship, our obedience to him, and our love expressed to others through good works. All of this ultimately gives glory to God when we follow this way of life. It will glorify our Father in heaven. And that is the whole duty of mankind and the ultimate meaning of life. The meaning of life is to glorify God. As long as you can do that, through the power and strength of God, not by your own works or effort, 
but by God's grace, then you will have peace. The Lord has given us each gifts and each different ways to glorify him. Let the Lord work through you. Let others see your good works so that they may praise the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the meaning of life. And that should serve as an encouragement for us as followers of Christ. So we covered apologetics, how a Christian should behave. What is the purpose and reason? We covered, with own, we covered owning your faith. And we also covered the meaning of life. It's, I know it was a long time. But if you have time, listen to the video, listen to the discussion. Uh, I believe it was uh, Holy Spirit inspired and driven. And I pray that all of you are inspired to follow Christ more.